Hey everybody, welcome to another OCHEM video. We're going to be covering reactions part two on the MCAT. So today's video is going to, to include uh, oxidation and reduction of carbons in OCHEM. Um, we're going to talk about tautomerism between ketones and enols. Uh, we'll talk about ketoenol um, or enolate uh, kinetics and thermodynamics uh, products, as well as a whole slew of addition reactions. So what we'll start with is by defining what is an addition reaction? So this was something that we had talked about at the end of last lecture, where we kind of defined what are the bond changes in addition, elimination, and substitution reactions. So as a quick refresher, addition reactions, or addition in general, in OCHEM is defined as the gain of a sigma bond, which is from a nucleophile, and the loss of a pi bond, which in most cases will be a carbonyl. So our generic addition reaction will look like this. So when we have a carbonyl, we always have a polar bond. We know that oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. And so we know that the carbon is going to have a partial positive charge and the oxygen is going to have a partial negative charge. So our nucleophile is really gonna like that partial positive charge of the carbon. And because the carbon is making a pi bond, we can have a reaction happen with no leaving group because the pi bond can go up and become a lone pair on oxygen. And now we have a new bond to the nucleophile and the carbon. And in most cases, there's going to be a follow-up step where we protonate the O minus. And so if we look at our definitions here, we gained a sigma bond between the carbonyl and the nucleophile, and we lost a pi bond between the carbon and the oxygen. So this will be our generic reaction. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a series of reactions where we change up who the nucleophile is, and we see what are the nuances or what are some of the differences between all of these reactions. Any questions before we head into our first um, addition reaction, which is going to be addition of hydrides? All right. So first reaction is going to be hydride reductions. And so what are our two main reducing agents for the MCAT? Of course, yes, you can always, yeah, you can always unmute yourself to either ask me a question or to answer a question that I prompted you. What are our two main reducing agents for the uncat? Lithium luminohydride. hydride. Yep. And the other guy is? Sodium borohydride, perfect. So if we draw out our structures here, how many bonds do boron and aluminum prefer to make? How many bonds do boron and aluminum prefer to make? They like to have a full octet? No, they like to have three bonds, right? And so because these have a valence number of three, 
but they're currently making four bonds, what charge are Born and Aluminum going to have? Minus one, perfect. So these guys aren't really happy. They are willing to give up not only an H, but they're willing to let the H take the electrons with it so that they can finally have their three, uh, their three bonds. Now, do we remember which one of these is the stronger reducing agent? Is it sodium borohydride or lithium aluminum hydride? Yeah, lithium aluminum hydride is gonna be our stronger reducing agent. We'll call this one strong and we'll call this one weak. So to be a reducing agent, you have to be able to give up an H minus, a hydride. And this is common in metabolism as well. As anybody who's seen our metabolism video probably knows. So if, a, if lithium aluminum hydride is a stronger reducing agent, it must be better at giving up a hydride. And so this is the case. Can anybody think of why might lithium, why might aluminum be better at giving up a hydride than boron? What's the, what are the differences between boron and aluminum? Larger radius, excellent. That's the nail on the head. So aluminum being larger, means that it makes weaker bonds, weaker covalent bonds to hydrogen. And so it is a better hydride donor. It's a better hydride donor. Excellent, any questions here? All right, so let's go ahead and let's look at a example of a hydride reduction. So we'll bring up our generic carbonyl. And then we will have our, we'll choose, we'll use borohydride here. And so borohydride, you know, is willing to give up an H minus. Uh, how do we want to do this? So it's willing to give up an H minus. And as we reviewed in our generic reaction, uh, we have a partial positive and partial negative on our carbonyl. And so our hydride will serve as the nucleophile. We'll attack the carbon of the carbonyl to break the pi bond. And so this is one way we could show mechanistically what happens in a hydride reduction. And this is true some of the time, the H minus will leave and other times we'll just have the borohydride directly donate to the H minus. So technically showing it either way is valid. And so this is what a hydride reduction actually looks like. Are there any questions on hydride reductions so far? So we'll now have the O minus, and then step two, we'll protonate our O minus, and here's that new hydrogen. A person DM'd me saying, why B have negative charge? Ah, yes, um, because if we think about our formal charge formula, remember the formal charge formula is going to be the valence number. And people will say minus dots and sticks. Um, or I just like to draw a circle and I like to count how many things are in it. So I drew a circle and I've got one, two, three, four things. So our boron's valence number is three and we're subtracting four to give us minus one. Uh, where's the H that is protonating, that is protonating com coming from? Oh, the, uh, so this was a BH4 minus, and then it becomes a BH3 and an H minus. So we could either say that this hydrogen is this hydride, 
and it takes the lone pair from boron as well, and then goes and reduces the carbonyl. Or we could say that it directly comes from the boral hydride. Uh, what about the aldehyde H coming from reducing agent? That's right. Mm -hmm. um, what about uh, the ketone? The uh, second hydrogen. Oh, um, this would be, you would either, if you were doing this reaction, you would either add H plus, like just add like acid after your first step was done. Um, or we could say if this was done in a polar, like a, if this was done in like water, that this guy deprotonates water. So either way, that hydrogen is going to come from somewhere. Um, it's either in the solution already or we add it separately. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right, so that's hydride reductions. Now let's talk about uh, oxidation states of carbon. So what is the most reduced that carbon can be? What is the most reduced that carbon can be? We'll call this level zero, where carbon is not oxidized at all. And therefore, we need carbon to be bound to four atoms that are less electronegative than carbon is. So the most reduced that carbon can be would be methane. And so if we increase the number of electronegative atoms that carbon bonds to by one, we could have alcohols, or it could be a chlorine. Um, anything that's more electronegative than carbon will increase carbon's oxidation. If we continue, we have aldehydes, ketones, hemiacetal, acetal, You have dichloromethane. Um, and so these are a few people that we're going to be seeing today. Um, we could throw in, just for fun, imines as well. If we continue, now we will enter the carboxylic acid derivatives territory. Now we have three bonds to more electronegative elements. We have carboxylic acids, we have esters, we have anhydrides, acid chlorides, amides. So it could be chlorine and two oxygen bonds, could be nitrogen and two bonds to oxygen. We could have chloroform. And what is the most oxidized that carbon can be? What is the most oxidized that carbon can be? So if we have carbon with four bonds to oxygen, there's a couple different molecules that have this. Here we have carbon dioxide. And so at the end of aerobic respiration, this is the most oxidized carbon will be. And we know, um, we know catabolism is oxidative. So as we catabolize carbon, we're taking away hydrogens. We're progressively oxidizing carbon to the point where it has now four bonds to oxygen. So this is one example of the most oxidized carbon could be. We could also do carbonic acid would qualify as well, or carbon tetrachloride. Any questions here? Do need all four valence electrons to the more oxidized? Yep, exactly. Yeah, so when, um, if you've reviewed uh, my video on oxidation numbers, I think it was the very first video I put out on this channel. Um, we have a really, really good review of 
oxidation and reduction that goes far more detail than we can possibly go into today. Um, so definitely check that out. Essentially what we mean when carbon is highly oxidized is it's bound to more electronegative elements that are gonna hug all the electrons in the bonds, making this carbon particularly electron poor. Whereas this carbon is actually more electronegative than all the uh, hydrogens that it's bonded to. So in the carbon to hydrogen bonds, Carbon's the one that's hogging all the electrons. So carbon's reduced when it has less electronegative atoms and it's oxidized when it's bound to more electronegative atoms. Cool, cool. All right, any other questions before we look at this a different way? Throw in our oxidizing and reducing agents. Okay, so in that example, oxidation of carbon was on the y-axis. In this example, Oxidation of carbon is going to be on the x-axis. So we will start with primary alcohols and secondary and tertiary. And a very sad cat in my on my on my end. Might have to put him away soon. I'll feel bad, but uh, yeah, he's going to have all the love and attention he needs tonight. So if we oxidize a primary alcohol, there's two degrees of oxidation we can go. We could start by going to an aldehyde. Okay, give me one sec. So our first degree of oxidation for a primary alcohol is going to be to an aldehyde. And if we oxidize it even more, we can take it to a carboxylic acid. So at this point, we're gonna be talking about the weak and strong oxidizing and reducing agents. Uh, let's see. So our weak oxidizing agent for the MCAT, the main one you're gonna see, or you could see in an OCHEM context at least would be PCC. You may remember from, uh, you may remember from OCHEM also DMP. I would say that's probably less likely to show up on the actual MCAT. I'm <laughs> And then strong oxidizing agents. Um, on the uncat, we'll see things that have a lot of oxygen, such as chromium uh, six oxide. Yep, KMNO4, love it. KMNO4, also very common. Uh, dichromate, exactly. Cr2O7, two minus. And then a little less likely to show up, but hypochlorite, OCL minus. And then if we also think about biological systems, um, we could think about oxidizing agents being things like NAD plus, FAD, with the oxidizing agents that get themselves reduced. And again, for more review on reduction and oxidation that we have time for in this video, check out my oxidation uh, numbers video. And then for reducing agents, We'll have our weak and our weak and our strong reducing agents as well. As we already discussed, our sodium borohydride and lithium aluminum hydride. Of course, in a biological system or a biological context, uh, we could have also be thinking about things like NADH, NADPH, FADH2 being reducing agents. Oh, the, the, okay, you got, got it. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, sorry, that's a little, a little bit hard to see. I'll move my camera really quickly close to this. Um, and then anybody who's watching this video could take a screenshot, um, whether you're live right now or whether you're on YouTube later. Okay. So for our oxidation of primary alcohol to aldehyde, what's gonna work here, we'll use warm colors for oxidation, we'll use cool colors for reduction. And so uh, 
a strong, how do I want to do this? I'm going to do like S and W, weak oxidation. So if we weakly oxidize the primary alcohol, we get an aldehyde. If we strongly oxidize the primary alcohol, we get a carboxylic acid. And then we can also strongly oxidize the aldehyde and it will become then a carboxylic acid. For secondary alcohols, they will get oxidized to ketones. And for this, there's no other path that the secondary alcohol can take. It doesn't have an option between two functional groups. So then any oxidation will turn a secondary alcohol into a ketone. What about tertiary alcohol? Can those guys be oxidized? Nope. The tertiary alcohol is stuck. It's got already three bonds to carbon. Now, in terms of reductions, so we can reduce an aldehyde. And in this case, does it matter whether we use a strong or a weak reducing agent? Doesn't matter. Does it, we, can, we can't like over reduce it. But a weak reducing agent will do the job. So we can say any reducing agent will work here. What about this? Would any work? Would we need a strong? Would we need a weak to reduce a carboxylic acid? Would that be weak, strong, or any? We would need, we'd need strong. So we would need lithium aluminum hydride. Carboxylic acids, they just can't get touched by sodium borohydride. It's not strong enough. And likewise for secondary alcohols and ketones, um, any reducing agent will work. So here's how to utilize your oxidizing and reducing agents for MCAT organic chemistry. Any questions here? Uh, what about carbon silic acid aldehyde? Great question. So let's think about what will happen. If we use a weak reducing agent, sodium borohydride, nothing happens. If we use a strong reducing agent, we go all the way back here. So there's actually no way to stop at aldehyde when you're reducing a carboxylic acid for MCAP purposes. In, in real life organic chemistry, I'm sure there is. <laughs> Somebody's found a way. Um, what context can the MCAT ask about these reactions? Oh, yes, <laughs> can you ask a, in a lot of different contexts? They could, they could literally give you like a uh, reactant product, which of the following um, reagents will produce this transformation. Um, they, could, they could give you one, any of these. They could uh, say, you know, they could show like a, a blank, like a blank space between two reaction steps where like the first reaction step is like one of these guys and then have you predict the intermediate. So yeah, a lot of different contexts that you could, uh, you could see this in for sure. Yep, my pleasure. All right, um, any other questions here before we keep going? All right, so let's continue talking about our addition reactions. We're gonna go over to organometallic. And there's only gonna be one organometallic reagent that you need to be familiar with for the MCAT, which is the Grignard. They used to have organolithium as well. So uh, for this, one, we're gonna start with We'll start with an alkyl bromide. <coughs> and we will run this over magnesium and ether. Not important that you know that's ether. 
So who's more electronegative, carbon or bromine? Bromine is, right? So we would have a partial negative and a partial positive. So car carbon and bromine, they got this thing going on. They got this covalent bond. Magnesium comes into the picture. All of a sudden, magnesium is in the middle of a, of a once thriving relationship between carbon and bromine. Um, so magnesium is part of this polyamorous relationship now. And everything, everything turns around because who's more electronegative, carbon or magnesium? Carbon or a metal is more electronegative. Now carbon is more electronegative than magnesium. So the whole dynamic is switched now. And now carbon is electronegative because it is being more electronegative sorry, partially negative. Carbon being more electronegative than magnesium is going to steal the electrons from magnesium. And what we basically have here, this is such a polar bond, it's basically ionic. So we have R minus and MgBr plus. And so what we've created is a strong, carbon nucleophile, strong carbon nucleophile, which you can use to do reactions. So an example of a Grignard reaction, let's say that we used methyl magnesium iodide. So what's important in a Grignard reagent is that it consists of a magnesium and some carbon group and some halogen that's not fluorine. So you can have a magnesium bromine, chlorine, or iodine. And so what's gonna happen here is carbon's gonna take those electrons between it and magnesium in the bond here and attack the partially positive carbon of the carbonyl, producing this guy which we then subsequently protonate. So we have our second example of an addition reaction with Grignard reagents. Um, any questions here so far? Let's see, was there something else I wanted to mention? I think that's it for now. So Grignards are, um, they're excellent nucleophiles. You're most likely to see a Grignard in the context of electrophiles for Grignard will tend to be ketones and aldehydes, esters and epoxides. Uh, since hydrogens are the most electronegative, wouldn't they take the most electron density from both the magnesium and carbon? Um, so if you think about our Fonkel Brisch, hydrogen's actually going to be less electronegative than carbon. Oh, halogens, sorry, sorry, I read that as halogens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I read that as hydrogens, um, uh, the halogens. So the, the halogen is gonna form an ionic bond with the metal, um, but it's not gonna interact with, the metal is now bonded to the halogen, it's not bonded to the, bonded to the carbon. Yeah. <laughs> uh, by the way, what type of reaction is this in the formation of the Grignard? What type of reaction? Is that an acid-base reaction? Is it a redox reaction? Is it a substitution reaction? What's the oxidation state of magnesium metal? It's redox, yeah. So magnesium metal is gonna have an oxidation state of zero 
whereas magnesium here is going to have an oxidation state of plus two. Um, and then the one who's going to be reduced here is carbon, because carbon is actually gaining the two electrons once it is bound to magnesium. Any other questions here? All right, so another property of green. Uh, yep. Charlie, I have a question. So uh, why did you put I mean, I don't understand. Um, so magnesium is, you're using as what in that reaction? Um, magnesium is there to make sure that carbon has the electrons needed to act as a nucleophile. Uh-huh. So it's also in the product? To, like, how, how does it get oxidized there? Oh, in this top reaction here? In the top reaction, magnesium gets oxidized when it makes a bond to carbon. Um, because when, when magnesium is making the bond to carbon, it is going to, uh, it's going to leave, it's going to give up its two electrons to carbon. Oh, okay. I see. Okay. Got you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that's, so that's the, the two electrons, if we're being technical, the two electrons that carbon has are actually used to belong to magnesium. Mm-hmm. Oh, the other thing that I remembered I was going to say. Um, so this is a, one thing to note here is this is a carbon-carbon bond forming reaction. And it's one of the only carbon-carbon bond forming reactions on the MCAT. Um, the other main one is going to be enolates and cyan cyanide. Um, so three carbon-carbon bond forming reactions of the MCAT, enolates, cyanide, and Grignard reagents. So if you ever are looking at a reaction scheme, you see there was a new carbon-carbon bond that formed. I've seen stuff like this on UWorld. You can narrow it down pretty quickly that it's a Grignard reagent based on the context uh, by starting to narrow it down in terms of how many carbon-carbon bond forming reactions do we know? Not really all that many. Okay, and then uh, Grignard reagents are also strong bases. Grignards are also strong bases. So for instance, if we tried to react acetic acid with ethyl magnesium bromide, what's gonna actually happen, let me ask you this, what, is faster, a nucleophilic attack or an acid-base reaction? What is faster, a nucleophilic attack or an acid-base reaction? An acid-base reaction is faster than a nucleophilic attack because acid-base reactions in the Bronsted-Lowry definition is simply a proton transfer. So this reaction happens faster. Electrons will return to oxygen. This reaction is going to happen faster than the nucleophilic attack. So instead of forming, presumably, if you're if you're doing this reaction, listen, there's there's better ways to do to make these products. There's better ways to deprotonate a carboxylic acid. What did we make? We made ethane. There's better ways to do this. So if you're a chemist, you're probably trying to attack the carbon of the, uh, of the carboxylic acid from the carbonyl. Um, and so obviously that's not how we should be doing that. So really loud helicopter over here, sorry about that. And I'm just trying to see if I can see it, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so then Let's say we wanted to do a reaction where, um, let me get rid of this. Let's say we wanted to turn this into this. Could we simply use a methyl Grignard reagent? Would that get the job done?
or would there is there a weak acid that the methyl Grignard reagent could react with? What could the methyl magnesium bromide react with instead of attacking the carbonyl? We do have an alcohol. Anybody know the pKa of an alcohol? Do you know the pKa of an alcohol? So alcohol has a pKa of 15. It is a weak acid. So the problem is we can't do this directly because simply a, 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 an acid base reaction is going to happen. And as I said, that's going to happen faster than nucleophilic attack. So the reason why I include this example is this is a really good place to introduce protecting groups. So the protecting group here is going to be TBSCL. And this isn't for you to memorize um, silo ether protecting groups. This is mostly just to um, introduce the concept because you can see them talking about protecting groups in a passage for sure. So the TBS is going to protect this alcohol. And again, if we were in an undergrad OCHEM class, we'd talk a little bit more about TBS, um, but for, this is just the, pur the purpose here is just to talk about protecting groups. So a protecting group exists to protect or preserve a functional group that's reactive with a step that you want to do to something else in the molecule. So in this case, the OH could be reactive to the Grignard. We protect it using TBS because we don't want it to react with the OH. We want it to react with the carbonyl. So after step two, and we'll add H plus as a follow-up for that. After step two, We've successfully completed the transformation. And now we can just get rid of our protecting group. And again, not something to memorize. TB, TBATH is the reagent that takes this particular protecting group off. If you were asked about um, protecting groups in a passage or in a question, they would have to give you some degree of context. So again, this is mostly to talk about protecting group strategy. Any questions here? Is there, is there a question? I think somebody's mic's on. Okay, cool, cool. And where are we going now? Okay, we're done with this page. And now, Let's talk a little bit more about aldehydes and ketones. Aldehydes versus ketones. So every carbonyl has a minor resonance structure contributor that we normally just um, don't, we normally don't show. We kind of just indicate the partial charges. But there's a minor resonance structure where the oxygen has both electrons from the bond and the carbon is a carbocation. So which two, which one of these um, minor resonance structures is more stable, the aldehydes or the ketones? What do we remember about carbocations? Perfect, the ketones. So we have two electron donating groups to help stabilize this carbocation versus one electron donating group to help stabilize this carbocation. So this guy is gonna be more stable. And this guy is gonna be more reactive. 
So alkalis and ketones, very similar in most ways. This is one difference. When we talk about reactivity, aldehydes are more reactive than ketones. Any questions on this one? All right, we're done with that page. And now let's talk about hemiacetals and acetals. So if we start with an aldehyde ketone, either or, and we react with an alcohol. We first form and we would use catalytic H plus. Would we, what would we form here? Would we first form a hemiacetal or an acetal? So the hemi or the acetal form first? The hemiacetal forms first. So you would start by forming a hemiacetal. And we're, we're gonna show this as like the ketone one um, with two carbons at the bottom. Um, and the MCAT used to use, or not the MCAT, but organic chemists used to use this terminology of hemiacetal versus hemiketal and acetal, as we'll see in a second, versus ketal. So we don't worry about those terms anymore because hemiketals and ketals have been combined or subsumed into the definition of hemiacetal and acetal. So this could be another R or it could be a hydrogen and we would just call it a hemiacetal. So there's no, um, there's no ketal or hemiketal nomenclature in organic chemistry anymore. Chemists decided they got tired of that and they changed the rules on everybody, but it's still kind of out there. So you might see some, especially third-party MCAT products like PrEP products that still refer to hemiketals as being a different thing than hemiacetals. But for the purposes of the MCAT, all OHOR will be hemiacetal and all OR, OR will be acetal. So if you see a third party product that refers to those, that's where that comes from. It's an old school nomenclature. Um, even when I took OCAM in like 2014, 2013, um, we didn't, there was like, we'd already gotten rid of those old terms. So it's a, it's a very old term at this point. And we would lose water. And let's go ahead and also keep track of the original uh, carbonyl oxygen. So it's gonna start by appearing in the OH and then it's gonna appear in the water. That's where the original carbon, or sorry, the original carbonyl oxygen is. Um, any questions on acetal formation? Uh, where will we see hemiacetals during biological reactions? Um, can anybody know? Where do we see hemiacetals all the freaking time? Which biological molecule contains a hemiacetal? Carbohydrates, yeah. Um, and then, so in a, in a monosaccharide, you'll see hemiacetals. Um, in a polysaccharide, you'll see acetals, um, which are part of the glycosidic linkage. Yeah. So that's where you're most likely to see hemiacetals um, and acetals. I can't remember if there's any examples in metabolism, but for sugars, definitely. Uh, well, I guess the <laughs> glucose is in metabolism. So that's one place we would see it, but it doesn't really participate in like metabolic reactions, but it definitely, you'll see hemiacetals and acetals when you study like glycogen, um, when you study like, yeah, formation of glycogen, um, or, or glycogenolysis and that kind of thing. And then, okay, so we'll, we'll use this example and let's compare it to this example. So here's reaction A and reaction B. 
let's say in reaction B, we used instead of two alcohols, one diol. So you may have seen something like this before. I think the organic chemists call this the Bart Simpson reaction because it like, looks like the shape of Bart Simpson's head from The Simpsons. And then of course we'd have a water byproduct as well. So uh, between these two reactions, which one would be more, uh, is that a protecting group? It is often used as a protecting group for aldehydes and ketones. So yeah, they, they like to use this a lot as a protecting group for aldehydes and ketones, nice. So between, uh, between reaction A and reaction B, which reaction is more favorable? Which reaction is more spontaneous? Reaction A or reaction B? So if we think about reaction A and B, when we talk like about favorability, spontaneity, we're really referring to Gibbs free energy. And within Gibbs free energy, there's two other thermodynamic properties. Reaction B, because it's cyclic. Yep, yeah, you're on the right track already, for sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so the, the answer is B. But uh, so let's talk, let's talk about this. So when we talk about spontaneity, thermo, uh, favorability, we're talking about the thermodynamic property of delta G. And delta G is a combination of two other thermodynamic properties, which are enthalpy and entropy. And so in, enthal in enthalpy, what we're really talking about is bond stability. Enthalpy is all about, do, am I making more or less stable bonds? When I make more stable bonds, some energy gets released as heat and we have an exothermic reaction. If I make less stable bonds, energy gets consumed in the form of heat in order to make those more unstable bonds. And that would be an endothermic reaction. So, and so enthalpy is one of the ways that we talk about how spontaneous a reaction is. In this case, we're making the same functional groups. We're making an acetal, we're making an acetal. Um, we're starting from a carbonyl, a, a ketone, for instance. So we're not really changing the stability of any bonds. So instead we'll think about entropy. So in entropy, what's the first thing that we always look at when we're deciding if a reaction has a positive or a negative entropy? What's the first thing we look for? What state of matter? Oh, you might be thinking about ring strain. Um, one, two, three, four, five. We have a five membered ring, so there's not a lot of ring strain. Um, five and six membered rings have the least amount of ring strain. But that's a good thought, because that does have to do with um, like enthalpy uh, as well as probably entropy. So when I think of entropy, the first thing that comes to mind is is there a gas present? If we are forming gas, that is almost always going to be a positive entropy we're forming a gas. If we're consuming a gas, that's almost always going to be, and for the MCAT, always going to be um, a, uh, a, a decrease in entropy, a negative delta S. So the first thing to look for when you're deciding about entropy of a reaction, the first thing is always how many moles of gas are there on each side of the reaction equation? In this case, we don't have any gas anywhere. So that's out. The second thing that we look at, <laughs> Uh, the second thing that we look at is liquids and uh, aqueous species. Uh, and then the lot, third thing we look at is solids. If there's the same amount of liquids in aqueous species, then we start thinking about solids. Um, and in this case, everything is in the same state. Everybody's aqueous except for water, which is a liquid. So we're gonna count number of moles of reactants and products. Remember that the H plus is catalytic. So we're not going to include that guy. Um, so we have one, uh, technically, sorry, here. We have one, two, three molecules on our left side of this reaction versus one, two molecules on our right side. So would that be an increase or a decrease in entropy? A decrease, perfect. 
there'll be a decrease in entropy. We're going from more moles, three moles, to less moles, two moles. Everybody's in the same state of matter. Um, but we know that having more molecules is always going to be more entropy, provided everybody's in the same phase, because the more molecules you have, the more degrees of rotation all of those molecules have. And the, the best definition of entropy is about the number of microstates a system can form. And if you have three, um, if you have three things, like three markers here, you can form a lot more different potential like um, microstates. Every, every single time I turn one of these a little bit, I'm creating a new microstate. If I have only two things, I can form a lot less microstates. And so having three things will be more entropy than having two. So the reaction A has a negative delta S. Whereas since we used a cyclic alcohol, or sorry, a, a, a diol and formed a cyclic alcohol or acetal, we have one, two. We have one, two on our right side. So that's the reason that you've seen this pop up as a protecting group, because if we, uh, because acetals are good protecting groups for aldehydes and ketones, but the reason why we tend to use the cyclic version is because it's more entropically favorable. And so we don't have to work very hard to get, it's, a, it's a, around zero, I'm not gonna say equal to. So we don't have to work as hard to get the reaction to happen. Um, whereas this, this reaction might require like reflux and other, other adjustments, higher temperatures. Any questions? Any questions on hemi and acetals? Good, good. All right, moving on. Imines and enamines. So to talk about imines and enamines, we'll first have to talk about degrees of substitution for amines. Uh, where's a good place to do this? I'm gonna do this in the bottom left corner. So we have, of course, ammonia. We have a primary amine. Primary amine. We have a Secondary amine, oh, you can see that. We have a secondary amine. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we have a tertiary. Uh, you know the meme? Uh, it's like a very old school meme where somebody's like, plan ahead. Um, that's what happened here. And then quaternary amines. So these are our degree of substitution for amines and including ammonia here as well. Um, would this guy have a charge, this nitrogen? That have a plus one charge, excellent. Um, for a bonus point, anybody see, anybody know where we've seen in biology, a nitrogen with a positive charge um, that is a quaternary amine? Quaternary amine. Right. Do we know the molecule acetylcholine? So acetylcholine is an example of a quaternary amine. Yep, the molecule, the neurotransmitter, the famous neurotransmitter. Yep. And so here's our acetyl as well. And then choline is the whole rest of this. So acetyl and the rest is choline. So choline has a, has a quaternary nitrogen. Any for another bonus point, anybody know where we've seen this that's not in acetylcholine? Anybody know where else we see choline? 
or what else we might need choline for in our bodies. Right here, we have phosphatidylcholine. Is a good one. Phosphatidylcholine. So it's an it's also an example of a phospholipid. So here's our choline, here's our phosphate, and then here's our glycerol, and here's our one fatty acid, and here's our other fatty acid tail. So that's where we've seen perhaps one of these choline molecules or quaternary nitrogens before. All right, so aldehyde and ketone addition reactions involving amines and ammonia. So we have amines. Uh, well, hold on with that thought. Let's start with our aldehyde and our ketone. We'll use a ketone. And if we apply a primary amine or ammonia, we get an imine with catalytic H plus. If we, and we do not have time <laughs> to go over these mechanisms um, and they're not super important for you to be familiar with either. And then if we use a secondary, amine, catalytic H plus, we get an enamine, enamine uh, where we have a double bond here. So an enamine, you can basically think about as a carbonyl, but for nitrogens. Um, an enamine, it's kind of analogous to an enol, uh, oh, do we have to memorize acetylcholine and choline structures? Um, I mean, I wouldn't put choline on like the top of my list of molecules to know itself. So here's choline. But you certainly need to be familiar with acetyl. Yeah, um, acetylcholine, I mean, It'd be a good thing to be able to recognize if you saw like a if you saw if you saw an acetylcholine in a passage like a structure of acetylcholine where they didn't tell you it. I mean, I would love to be one of those students who's like, oh, I know acetylcholine. That's acetylcholine, um, and then maybe I can get to a point later down the line more quickly than somebody else. That's that's where my mind goes. But I don't know if you should memorize choline. You've seen it now. Um, you'll see it again. It's like once you once you learn something. Once you, like, once you learn a new word, you start to see it everywhere. Same with OCHEM. Once you learn a new, or science in general, once you learn something new, you start to see it a lot of places. Um, so we can think about an enamine as kind of analogous to an enol in the sense of, like it's combining like the definition of an amine with like alkene. And yeah, that's um, imines and enamines. Any questions on these guys? All right, so um, we will cover next um, keto enol tautomerism. Keto enol tautomerism. Um, and then we'll go over kinetic versus thermodynamic enolates. And then we will wrap things up with the aldol condensation. All right, so tautomerism. What is tautomerism? Or what are tautomers? Well, does anybody know what a tautomer is? Or two tautomers are to each other. Let's start with, do they have the same molecular formula? Isomers, yes. Mm -hmm. Isomers. Are they, um, what kind of isomers? Are they uh, constitutional or stereo? Or uh, constitutional structural versus stereo? Yep, constitutional, which is the same as structural. So what defines tautomers out of constitutional isomers in general is tautomers are readily interconvertible 
constitutional isomers. So what we mean by readily interconvertible doesn't mean that they exist in a 50-50 like equilibrium. It means that kinetics permits their interconversion relatively easily, but thermodynamics may not prefer both equally. So it means that you can convert them between each other, but it doesn't mean that they're gonna exist in the 50-50. And in fact, and our, our most uh, famous or most common MCAT example of tautomerism is keto enol. It's gonna be our most common And we will show the basic mechanism for ketoenol tautomerism. So, So this is the mechanism for ketoenol tautomerism. You may see it in a, a variety of different ways. Um, you could see this happen in acid. We could see this happen in base. So we have our keto tautomer, which is the, uh, the more stable between the two. And we have our enol tautomer as well. And the ratio in solution for these things is about a thousand to one. So we really don't see a whole lot of enols. Uh, we could also have the, this guy as well, being the, uh, the trans isomer. So we don't see a whole lot of enols in practice uh, because uh, thermodynamics vastly prefers the keto form. So generally the reason for, uh, the reason for thermodynamics preferring the keto form is a C double bond O has a higher bond enthalpy So it's more stable than a C double bond C. Can anybody think of why a C double bond O would be more stable than a C double bond C? Electronegativity is one. So one of the two main reasons is Polar bonds are more stable or stronger bonds. What else? Oxygen versus carbon. Uh, yeah, and unfortunately you don't have a lot of time to go into it today, but basically when you have a polar bond, the, the way it's been explained to me by somebody I trust, was that a, a more, I, although I didn't hear about this in class per se, but um, my, my, I'll, I'll tell you who it was. It was my, my trainer for Princeton Review when I was, uh, when I was being trained to teach OCHEM. Um, so a more polar bond is a more stable bond because the difference in electronegativity, the unequal sharing of electrons makes this oxygen more negative and this carbon more positive. And what do negatives and positives like? Each other. So the unequal sharing of electrons leads to the bond being stronger because the oxygen and the carbon like each other even more due to the unequal sharing of their electrons. Sounds a little bit of a toxic relationship, but that's kind of how it's been explained to me and how I've accepted it. But yeah, more the, there's an equation associated with it too. Um, I, I was trying to find the equation associated with it earlier, but I couldn't find it. Um, but yeah, there, I think it was, it was like poly or something like that. Like the guy who's the exclusion, poly exclusion principle, I think it was the same guy has an equation for this that like shows why 
um, more polar bonds are more stable. Uh, and then the other reason would be who's bigger, oxygen or carbon? Who's, or who's, who's bigger, oxygen or carbon? Carbon is, right? Oxygen is further to the top right, and so it'll be smaller. And smaller, bond, smaller atoms make stronger bonds because they can form better overall overlap. So two reasons uh, being it's a more polar bond and it's also a shorter bond due to the smaller oxygen. And so that's why the keto uh, tautomer is favored um, over the enol tautomer to such a vast degree it's because of bond enthalpy. Questions here? There's one exception to this. And as soon as I start drawing it, you're going to know what I'm talking about. What's an enol we see all the time? Who's that guy? What is the name of that dude? Phenol, right? So one huge, uh, one huge ex uh, exception to this is phenol because when we form the keto version, what do we no longer have? What property was lost? Conjugation, aromaticity and conjugation. Um, in particular, aromaticity is like the worst thing to lose here because aromaticity is such a specifically, or such a stable specific example of conjugation. Yeah. Um, so would the K and Q, if this is the reactant and this is the product, would the K and Q be less than one or greater than one? K and Q would be less than one, yeah. And in fact, The phenol uh, is favored at a, a thermodynamic ratio of 10 to the power of 13 to one. So yeah, that, that doesn't happen. Um, any questions on keto enol tautomerism? Good, good. All right, let's talk about alpha hydrogens and enolates. So the shared conjugate base of keto and enol is called an enolate. The shared conjugate base of keto and enol is called an enolate. So the alpha hydrogen of a carbonyl is acidic with a pKa alpha hydrogen of a carbonyl is acidic with a pKa around 20, 19 to 20. So is that very acidic or very weakly acidic? Yeah, very, very weak, right, right. Um, so let's look at an example. So when we talk about alpha, um, the way that the system of nomenclature works is we start at a carbonyl, and when we count carbons away from the carbonyl, actually I should put it not where the hydrogens are gonna go. We use Greek letters. So the first carbon away from a carbonyl is an alpha. The second is a beta, third is a gamma. Uh, we're probably not gonna hear a whole lot about gamma, and so these alpha hydrogens here, there are three on this side, two on this side, are acidic. So we could take a base and deprotonate these alpha hydrogens. Let's use a molecule of acetaldehyde as an example. By the way, is this an alpha hydrogen? Is this guy an alpha hydrogen? Not quite, because 
It's actually on the carbon of the carbonyl, not on the carbon adjacent. So don't get confused by the aldehyde hydrogen. But these are alpha hydrogens, so these guys can be deprotonated. And if we use some base, use some base here. We can deprotonate. Forming this guy right here. And I'm going to start leaving my hydrogens out. Um, is this the only form of this conjugate base that we can see? Or does it have a, another structure? We have potential resonance structure. Yeah. And so if this guy becomes a carbonyl, or sorry, becomes a double bond, we could make the pi bond, these are double-sided arrow for resonance structures. And here's our other enolate resonance structure. Uh, we could draw the overall resonance hybrid as, this, showing that the electrons in this conjugated system are resonating between the oxygen to the carbon. Now, let me ask you this. Which one of these structures is more stable, the one on the left or the one on the right? Yes, the one on the right is going to be more stable. So what does that tell us? Is the carbon of an enolate, the carbanion, or the oxygen, the more nucleophilic? Which one is more nucleophilic, the oxygen or the carbon? Well, if the right structure is more stable, the left structure is more. Oh, uh, the question was, uh, is the oxygen or the carbon the better nucleophile? So if the right structure is more stable, the left structure is more. Reactive. And so the structure where carbon has the lone pair and the negative charge is the more reactive. So what we can say from this is that in an enolate, the carbon is the nucleophile. Yeah. Uh, so you may see this version of the enolate drawn in a mechanism. Um, and, it's, and it's kind of annoying because when you go to like react with an electrophile, the arrows that you have to draw for that structure on the right, it goes like boom and then boom. Whereas if we were to use this car this carbon as the nucleophile, we just go one arrow. So when I'm drawing mechanisms, especially under timed conditions, like on the MCAT, I'm gonna always draw this structure as the enolate structure, not this structure. Because even though I know this is more stable, I know that this one's gonna be the one that actually does work in my mechanism. Does that make sense? Charlie, if the Ka of alpha hydrogens is so low, why are the alpha hydrogens being kicked off to form the enolate? Uh, the answer is you'd have to use a very strong base. Yep. All right. So because enolates are nucleophiles, um, Deprotonation of an alpha hydrogen uh, can set up an addition reaction. 
and set up a nucleophilic attack, such as a substitution, but more often an addition. All right, any questions on enolates? So our next um, portion of our lesson today, and we're almost done here, we're gonna be talking about, we're gonna do a brief aside on common organic functional group PKA values that you need to know for the MCAT. And then we will do thermodynamic versus kinetic enolates and the aldol condensation and retroaldol and that will be it for today. All right, so let's talk about what are the PKAs that you need to know for the UNCAT in organic chemistry. Um, and we'll include the biochem ones as well. Okay, so um, common PKA values to memorize. Um, so we'll start with the C-terminal carboxylic acid, regular carboxylic acid, histidines, R group, um, N-terminal, amine, phenol, alcohol, and alpha hydrogen. So these are the seven pKa values I would memorize for the MCAT. And starting with the C-terminal carboxylic acid of an amino acid, what would be the pKa value for that guy? Round two. What about a regular carboxylic acid? So like acetic acid or something like that. These guys are around four to five. Um, does anybody know the pKa of histidines R group? If you're in my study group, you probably might know it. Uh, the C-terminal, so the This guy. Mm -hmm. So compared to a regular carboxylic acid, we can see the C-terminal is a lot more acidic. Why? Compared to a regular carboxylic acid, well, when we think about a regular carboxylic acid that doesn't have a nitrogen nearby, how is nitrogen helping stabilize that negative charge of our amino acid? How is nitrogen helping stabilize that negative charge of our amino acid? It's electronegative, so it's inductively withdrawing. So if you're ever wondering why the C-terminal carboxylic acid is so much more acidic than a regular carboxylic acid, it is due to the inductive effect by the highly electronegative nitrogen. And then histidines R group, the reason to know histidines R group has a pKa of six would be um, so that you know at physiological pH, it's actually protonated or deprotonated. Physiological pH of 7.4, would be not acidic enough to protonate this. And so histidines R group will be deprotonated at physiological pH. That's why we include that there. And terminus of amino acid is nine, 9.5 phenol, 10 alcohol, 15, um, 15 to 16 technically, but I like the whole like 5, 10, 15, 20 thing going on. And then alpha hydrogens around 20. So these are your uh, pKa values you definitely need to know for the MCAT. And if we had more time, we would talk maybe about some of the differences and the reasoning behind these. Um, but, and I'd be happy to at a later time for the purpose of this video, we're just gonna 
present these so that you can memorize them and you know which ones you do need to memorize. Any questions? Uh, Charlie, I have a question. Yeah, mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, so in histidine, you see like there are, um, there are more nitrogen. Uh, ring so like how would you know like um, with, with your audio is cutting out just a little bit so i didn't hear the whole question it. i mean since it's um I think the audio is cutting out. I don't know if it's on my end or your end. Uh, histidine, you see that there is a red. Is it possible you could type your question? Can you hear me now? A little better, a little better, yeah. Oh, now can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yes, a little bit, a little bit better. Yes. So in the histidine, you know, um, there's like a ring where you have two amine, like a two nitrogen in there? Mm -hmm. And there is one you see at the NH3 and then, oh. So I was gonna say how, if you have like um, uh, lower pH and you wanna protonate that, how would you do each nitrogen? Could you just explain? Uh, okay, how would you protonate the nitrogens here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let's see if we can see uh, histidine structure titration. Let's see if somebody's done this work for us. This looks pretty good. Yeah, so if we were doing a titration of histidine, um, so we'll start at the most basic and we'll pretend that we're adding acid, even though this is showing the opposite. So if we started here, everybody's deprotonated. Our N terminus is deprotonated, our C terminus is deprotonated, and our side chain is also deprotonated. So we have most basic, everybody's deprotonated. We get a net charge of minus one. And then the first guy to get protonated is the most basic group, which is the N terminus. So the N terminus will be protonated first at it, uh, in the average, where the pKa would be around nine, nine in this case, 9.17. So as we get more basic, sorry, more acidic than 9.17, this is gonna be the predominant structure. Then we have two kind of options for nitrogens to be protonated. If we think about who has like lone pairs in here, oops, uh, we have a lone pair right here. And we have a lone pair right here as well. So um, one question might be, well, which nitrogen gets protonated first? Which nitrogen is more basic? And the answer, let's see, how can I ask you, how can I tell you without telling you? Um, well, we can see, we can see that this guy got protonated first, right? What would happen if instead we tried to protonate this nitrogen? Why, why does this nitrogen actually seem to never get protonated? It's not protonated yet. So I think that's the first one's going to get protonated. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have H's. And then the other one, right? Apparently never gets protonated, even at a very low pH. Really? Okay, so the electrons are used for resonance. Chef's kiss, excellent. So if we were to protonate this, so this nitrogen has, remember to be in the conjugated club, you need at least a empty p orbital, such as a carbocation, a lone pair, or a pi bond. If you have a pi bond and you have a lone pair, like this nitrogen, you're free to use that lone pair for whatever you want, and you can still stay in the conjugated club. But if you're a nitrogen like this guy who only has the one lone pair, um, that nitrogen doesn't have an option to be protonated because if it gives up that one lone pair, it's no longer in the conjugated club, and so that's why we see that this nitrogen actually never gets, gets protonated, yeah. Oh, while the other one can get, even though it's in the ring? Yep, because even after it gets protonated, it still has that pi bond. So we're not technically breaking resonance. Mm -hmm. 
So then the second thing to get protonated would be the side chain on the nitrogen that's, part of, that's taking part of the double bond. And then the third thing to get protonated, or the last thing to get protonated is gonna be our carboxylate. And to the person who DM'd me, have a great night as well. All right, um, cool, Thank cool. You. My pleasure. I love talking about histidine. Um, it's, it's gotten a lot of people tripped up on calculating charge of peptide type of questions. So, yeah. All right, and then as promised, we have two main topics left, which are keto, or sorry, kinetic versus thermodynamic enolates and the aldol condensation and the retroaldol. All right, so, For this example of kinetic versus thermodynamic enolates, what we're going to do here is we're going to use a asymmetric ketone. And so, of course, we have two alpha hydrogens that are available for deprotonation. And so we have two potential different enolates that we could form. So if we use a base, on this side, we could deprotonate here. Would that be easier or harder than deprotonating on the other side? Would that be easier or harder than deprotonating on the other side? So this side is gonna be more sterically hindered than this side. So this is like the more difficult path. More sterically hindered. The more resonance structures, the easier. True, true. Um, you'll both have the same resonance structure or same number of resonance structures. But what we're going to talk about is going to be sort of ranking the stability of the resonance structures produced. So if instead we used in our purple path, we used a base and deprotonated on this side, then we can get our carbon ion on this side. And that was easier because. The alpha hydrogen on the methyl is less sterically hindered from the base. Oops, let's use the proper color coding here, Charlie. Easier. And then the two resonance structures we would form would be this guy and that guy. Okay. So now my question to you, let's see if anybody knows this already. Are alkenes more stable when they are more or less substituted? More or less substituted? Alkenes are more stable when they are more substituted. So even though this is a diff more difficult path to get off, to get kicked off, um, the payoff is better. More stable because you have a more substituted alkene. And this guy's going to be not as stable because it's a less substituted alkene. Right, so if we think about a, a reaction coordinate diagram for this process, let's see, we're going to start by calling this guy reactant. And then the purple path will be intermediate one and the blue path will be intermediate two. So in our reaction coordinate diagram, we know that the higher you go up, the more free energy you have. So higher up is more unstable, lower is more stable. So we'll start kind of in the middle with our reactant.
And then in this case, uh, normally we go from left to right. In this case, because there's two possible paths, we're going to go from middle to left and right. And so for we'll do our left path in purple on this side. So I'll give this. Uh, by the way, would our think think about would our intermediate have higher or lower energy than our reactant? Would our intermediate, either intermediate, have higher or lower react energy than our reactant? Higher energy because they're because both of our intermediates have a formal charge. So we'll put this guy here, intermediate one. And then would intermediate two be higher or lower than intermediate one? Intermediate two be higher or lower than intermediate one? Would be lower than intermediate one, because as we said, it's more substituted and therefore more stable. So yeah, both of our intermediates, having a formal charge is always less stable than not having a formal charge. The reactant is lowest, um, but followed by our, our more thermodynamically stable intermediate two and our less thermodynamically stable intermediate one. Which path would have the higher activation energy, intermediate one or intermediate two? Which path would have the higher activation energy? I'm gonna exaggerate how high this is. Which path would have the higher activation energy, intermediate one or two? Intermediate two is going to have the higher path because it was more sterically hindered. But as we said, the payoff is better. So which one of these is our kinetic product? Oh, can I rephrase the question? Sorry, I just saw that. Um, yeah, so which one is going to be our kinetic product, I1 or I2? I1 is gonna be our kinetic product. So our kinetic product, the kinetic path will always be characterized by a lower energy of activation, but by a more unstable product. The Thermodynamic product is always by definition the more stable. Um, and it will have a higher energy of activation. So it's harder to get to the thermodynamic product because it requires more energy to, in this case, to deprotonate the more sterically hindered carbon. Um, but it gives you a more stable product. Um, I'm gonna change this to less stable product. Yeah, less stable product, more unstable, less stable. So there's a, there's a passage on AMC somewhere. Um, I won't tell you exactly where it is. I'll let, you, I'll let you stumble upon that one by yourself and maybe you have seen it already, um, where they're comparing liposomes. Anybody know the passage I'm talking about? And they ask you, about the liposomes, which one is the kinetic and which one is the thermodynamic? Anybody encountered this AMC passage? Not yet. It's, um, it's infamous. <laughs> so um, the, the way that this, the way, and I'll, I'll kind of give you the background so that once you get there, you can, you can feel really smart. Um, 
So there's there's one there's one liposome that uh, it it all goes to like one average size after mixing liposomes of different sizes, and there's another liposome that when mixed is in multiple different sizes. So we have like everybody goes to one size versus multiple sizes. Which one of those sounds like the kinetic and which one of those sounds like the thermo? The one that all goes to one size sounds like it's gonna be the thermo. And the one that remains in multiple intermediate states of different sizes is the kinetic. The way that they trip you up <laughs> is they describe the kinetic product, one with the different sizes as stable to mixing. And so people who just associate, yeah, I know, the thermodynamic, people who just associate thermodynamic with stability are gonna get that wrong because the problem isn't that it is in the most stable form. The problem is it can't go over the activation energy barrier to get to the thermodynamic product. So that's why I'm emphasizing thermodynamic. We usually have a less number of products. Um, thermodynamic product we associate with equilibrium. So if you've obtained a thermodynamic product or a thermodynamic mixture, your reaction has gone to equilibrium. Or anytime you, you know a reaction has gone to equilibrium, you can take any and all products that are formed there as thermodynamic. When you have multiple intermediates, and in the case of like, so like what I do, um, why do we have kinetic product if like it's not the most stable or if the reaction goes to equilibrium it always forms a thermal product? Um, no, they don't give you any other information to help figure it out. Um, so kinetic products are when we have not reached equilibrium yet. And often the reason why we obtain kinetic products and not thermodynamic ones is because it just takes too long to get to equilibrium. Um, the activation energy barrier we would, need to, we would need to overcome is just too high given the reaction conditions we can produce in the lab. And so that's when we would see kinetic products. And that's why they're a thing, even though obviously, as we said, equilibrium is gonna give you the thermodynamic product. So then when to predict a kinetic versus a thermodynamic product, if you have less, if you have cooler, less hot temperatures, would you form the kinetic or the thermodynamic? Yeah, kinetic. If we have less, if we have lower temperature, it's easier to overcome this. So low temp will favor the kinetic product because we know that, think about our Arrhenius equation, the rate constant K, which is equal to A e to the negative uh, RT over activation energy. We know that the higher the temperature, uh, the higher the rate constant. The lower the temperature, the lower the rate constant. But if we have a lower activation energy at the same temperature, this one's gonna form faster. It's gonna have a higher rate constant. If we have high temp, then we're able to overcome the activation energy barrier and we get that payoff of having the more stable product. Right. Any questions on thermodynamic versus kinetic in, um, enolates before we wrap things up with the aldol condensation? All right, let us finish things up today with everybody's favorite reaction, the aldol condensation. So this is one of the most high yield reactions on the entire MCAT. Aldol condensation. Give me one second. Okay. The aldol condensation has two phases. Uh, it has phase one, which is the addition, and phase two, which is the elimination condensation. Aldol condensation is where an enolate serves as the nucleophile and an aldehyde or a ketone serves as the electrophile.
So if we were to take two molecules of um, propanol and aldehyde, and these guys are base catalyzed, these aldols. You can start by deprotonating an alpha hydrogen, forming our enolate. T for deprotonation. We know this dude would have a resonance structure. Like we said earlier, on the MCAT under timed conditions, we're only going to draw the carbanion resonance structure because that's the one who's actually nucleophilic. And then if we take our second equivalent of our original molecule, that one can serve as the electrophile. So this is called a self aldol condensation because one molecule of self will be the nucleophile and the other molecule of self will be the electrophile. And usually with aldol condensation, I find it very advantageous to number label some way my carbons. So you have one, two, three, A, B, C. Uh, Michael Jackson song always plays in my head. So we will form a bond between the alpha carbon of the first equivalent and the carbonyl carbon of the second equivalent. Um, and then just for, yeah. So we have a bond between carbon two and carbon C. So we'll start with that. Carbon C is gonna have its pi bond broken. Um, and then subsequently be protonated. Carbon C was also bonded to carbons B and A and nothing happened to them. So we can just leave them here carbon B and A. And then carbon two was the one who did the attack. So it's right there. Carbon two is bonded to carbons one and three, neither of which were changed in this reaction. So then we have carbon three and carbon one. Um, and then this guy is going to obtain a proton from somewhere. So I don't want to show a separate step just to have a protonation, but that is what we would see. And so we saw that a nucleophile formed a sigma bond to and, and caused a pi bond to be broken. So this is the addition product. Addition product. And you should be familiar with the, the systematic or the, the common name uh, the common like functional group pattern of a of the addition and as we'll see in a second the condensation product. So this guy we have alpha, beta, alpha, and then we have beta. So this guy is known as and there's the beta carbon here too, but we're referring to this carbon as we have a beta hydroxy carbonyl. So the, the addition product will always be a beta hydroxy carbonyl, carbonyl beta hydroxy. So that's something to be on the lookout for. Um, if you can recognize that maybe two of your answer choices on an alpha condensation problem, um, where it's just the addition portion, if you notice that maybe two of your answer choices don't have the beta hydroxy, maybe it's an alpha hydroxy or a gamma hydroxy, or there's no hydroxy. Um, you can start to maybe eliminate some answer choices by simply knowing the name of this dude. And also, if you forget how the reaction works, um, you can think, okay, I need to make a beta hydroxy. And then I'm going to redraw this guy. So there's one more alpha hydrogen left. And if we do the last step of the aldol condensation, the condensation step, which requires heat, 
um, typically would be reflux conditions. And we still have base to deprotonate a second alpha hydrogen. In this case, it will do an elimination reaction. So this is one of the reasons why we showed elimination reactions last time. We know that in elimination reactions, a leaving group leaves when a hydrogen on the adjacent carbon gets deprotonated. So here's our condensation elimination reaction. We would call it a condensation because we lost a net water across what is now our double bond. And so the characteristic, and then we'd have the, uh, the other isomer as well. Um, and then so we call this guy the alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl because across the alpha and beta bond, we have an unsaturated uh, where we've lot where we could we have two carbons that are connected to each other instead of being connected to carbons uh, to hydrogens so that is unsaturated. Any questions on the aldol condensation? So we'll show um, this is a self aldol condensation. We'll show one mixed aldol condensation, and then we will show retro one retro aldol and call it a day. Good, good. All right, so this reaction is gonna be called the practical mixed aldol. And for this example, We'll start with a molecule of benzaldehyde. And I'm gonna get rid of this H, it's still there, don't worry, but just for making the reaction happen. And then we'll use a molecule of this guy. And this is under basic conditions. So in this case, how many possible carb alpha carbons are there to deprotonate? How many possible alpha carbons are there to deprotonate? So we have two carbonyls, and this guy doesn't have an alpha carbon on this side. It does have an alpha carbon on this side. Does this alpha carbon have any hydrogens? Uh huh. So because we're on a benzene ring, we've got no alpha hydrogens. So so far, no deprotonatable ionizable alpha hydro alpha hydrogens present. Uh, what about this guy? Is there any alpha hydrogens here? No alpha hydrogens to be found. So we do have one possible location, which is right here. And so, okay, so we went over the steps of an aldol condensation and that's always, that's all very nice. How do we do an aldol condensation under timed conditions on the MCAT? So we definitely don't wanna be drawing entire reaction mechanisms if we don't have to. So let's practice our beta hydroxycarbonyl. So we know, of course, that this guy is going to make a bond to this guy. And this guy is going to have its pi bond broken. And boom, there's our alpha, there's our beta hydroxycarbonyl. So that's how we can kind of do an aldol condensation quickly. And we know in our second step, we're going to form an alpha beta unsaturated. And here's our alpha beta unsaturated. This is how I would want to be able, I would want to be as good for the MCAT 
um, to the, as this to the point where I don't have to draw all the mechanistic steps. I kind of know my way around this reaction, so I know what's going to happen without showing all of the steps. Okay, so there's a practical mixed aldol for you. By the way, very, very conjugated molecule. In fact, this part of the molecule is all conjugated because it's a benzene, still conjugated, still conjugated. So most of this molecule is conjugated, very, very stable. And then how do we do a retroaldol? So if we want to do a retroaldol, what we'll do is we'll first identify the alpha beta bond and we will cleave it. So then looking at this, uh, I've identified the alpha carbon. I know that was a nucleophile. I've identified the beta carbon. I know that was an electrophile. So it had to be originally a carbonyl. So then I know that the original structure of my two reactants must have been these. And likewise, if I see, okay, I have an alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl. I know that the new bond that forms is always between the alpha and the beta. So then I know my beta must have originally been a carbonyl and the rest of the structure shouldn't change. And then I know my alpha carbon was once just a regular basic carbon with nothing else going on. And so I can easily go backwards and figure out what my reactants were. Any questions on practical mixed aldol or retro aldol? So retro is going backwards, yeah. So anybody know any metab metabolic metabolism? Does anybody know a metabolism? Can't speak, it's been a long time. Um, anybody know any um, reactions of metabolism that involve a retroaldol? Anybody know an enzyme that has a name that's like aldol? Aldol lace. So, um, so the step four of glycolysis, aldolase, is a retroaldol reaction. How do I identify that it's a retroaldol reaction without um, seeing the mechanism? Well, I know that in a forwards aldol makes two molecules into one larger molecule. And a retroaldol makes one molecule into two smaller molecules. So therefore I can look at this guy and see that it's being broken into two structures. And I know that was a retroaldol reaction. So in what metabolic process would we be doing an aldol reaction? Not glycolysis, but Gluconeogenesis would be a regular aldol where we're making these two guys into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So aldolase in gluconeogenesis acts as a, um, uh, uh, oh, performs a aldol reaction. Yep. Um, any other question? And then of course, pentose phosphate pathway, there's also some of that stuff going on, transaldolase, transketolase. Um, any, um, any other questions while we are still recording for YouTube? Questions for the folks at home. All right, everybody. So um, if you are watching this on YouTube, thank you for, um, for viewing my content. I hope you like it. I hope this is helpful. Please feel free to leave any comments if, I, if there's anything I got wrong, if there's anything you really liked. Um, and if you would like to subscribe to my channel for more um, OCHEM content, uh, we'll be finishing up our reaction series of OCHEM next week. And going forward, we will um, cover OCHEM biomolecules in the next lecture. And then once we're done with that, I think we're going to cover all of GenChem for the MCAT. So good night, everybody.